first speaker is uh, Dr. Cole Harris from uh, the University of British Columbia. He's an historical geographer. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I feel honored and I feel humble uh, to be here. I, I feel also uh, in some ways an outsider. I've lived and my people for several generations in British Columbia. But in relation to a conference like this, I am, I think, an outsider. I have, I've studied the Douglas Treaties, but I've not lived within them the way some of you in, in this uh, room have. And I'm, I'm also a, uh, uh, I'm a colonizer. I and my people have come from outside. We've, we've settled here. And we have benefited from the displacement of native peoples uh, from their, from their, uh, their lands. So in, in both those basic senses, I, I speak from outside rather than inside this, uh, this uh, affair, this impressive affair. I was exceedingly impressed by what went on, uh, on this morning, particularly that, that first hour of remarkable uh, presentations. But now the Douglas Treaties. For me, the, perhaps the basic thing to say about the Douglas Treaties is that is that they are really exceedingly baffling. And that almost at, at every point, one can be baffled by these ambiguous treaties. The colonial office was. Its earlier enthusiasm for what we call liberal humanitarianism, its sense that all people were equal in the eyes of God, ideas that had come out of the Enlightenment, ideas that had come out of evangelical Protestant uh, Christianity, and out of uh, liberal uh, free trade, and that had produced, well, uh, the uh, abrogation of slavery in 1833, had produced the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840, had led one uh, foreign minister, Lord Glenelg, to go so far in, uh, in, uh, with regard to South Africa as to withdraw British troops and settlers from an area of Bantu territory that they had, that they had conquered and considered theirs. He said that it, was, it was Bantu land and it, it belonged to them and, the, and he, he ordered the British army out. But these ideas were by, we're now into the 1850s and these ideas have, uh, have, uh, have diminished, have almost disappeared from, from the colonial office, partly because of the ascendancy of, of a new body of ideas derived from scientific uh, racism in the years before uh, Darwin, and also from the failure, as, uh, as the liberal humanitarians saw it, of people elsewhere around the world to adopt Christianity, to settle in as docile, obedient uh, workers at the bottom of a, the socioeconomic hierarchy of, uh, of a European-dominated uh, social order. There, was, there were uprisings of free slaves in the, former pla in the plantation colonies in the West Indies. There was shortly to be uh, the mutiny in, uh, in India. The ideas of liberal humanitarianism were no longer in the air. And when it came to, is to granting new, to creating new colonies and to figuring out what to do with Aboriginal peoples therein, the colonial office was to a very large extent at a loss. It thought that there should be uh, reserves, but it didn't know quite how large they should be or, or where they should be. On the issue of prior rights, it really was flummoxed. There were different opinions in different uh, bodies uh, within the colonial office and around the empire. Uh, the colonial office tried to operate in a thoroughly pragmatic way. It had no, there was no basic body of principle to which it could uh, adhere. And in the case of this new uh, colony, there was a governor, a potential governor out here, Douglas, uh, who uh, in the colonial office's eyes, it had a good deal of uh, confidence. He, he seemed to know far more about the management of native people than, than the colonial office thought that, uh, that Americans, Americans did. So the colonial office is prepared to trust Douglas and to turn over to him a so whole set of questions that really itself it was not in a position to solve. Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company too was of two minds about this, as I think was mentioned this morning. The, the secretary of the company, Ar Archibald uh, uh, Barclay, uh, held that there was, there was no question of, of title, there was no question of prior rights, that the land belonged to the Hudson's Bay Company. Native people had, had rights to their, their village sites and their fields and no more. Uh, 
the governor of the company, uh, Pele, was not so sure. He thought that perhaps there was some, some issue of rights, and he certainly thought it, was, it would be convenient to, uh, in the interests of long-term stability, to make some, some purchases of land and encourage Douglas to do so. The uh, North American governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Simpson, was also of this view. He didn't know, Simpson's background was, was, didn't place him in a position to, to have any authoritative view on the issue of rights, but he certainly thought it would be convenient. In the long term, it would avoid a, a, a lot of, uh, of entanglements if there were some clear purchases of land at the, uh, at the onset. It's probable that Douglas thought much, this, much the same. But Douglas is exceedingly difficult to read. He's a fascinating and complex man. He comes out of a mixed uh, racial background himself. His wife is a product of the fur trade and is of, is of mixed descent. He'd lived for years in the fur trade. He spoke several native, I think he spoke several native languages. He certainly spoke Chinook fluently. And um, he'd, he'd, he'd lived in a Western North American indigenous realm uh, for, for most of his adult life. He was far more imbricated in, a, uh, in a, a Western North American native world than any of the people who succeeded him and had anything to do with, uh, uh, with uh, native, uh, native land issues. But, uh, but even Douglas, there's been no intel good intellectual biography of Douglas. Even Douglas is, uh, is uh, difficult to read. So at this level of background, there's a great deal of uncertainty about what should be done, particularly the issue, the issue of a title. And then when it comes to the, uh, the actual negotiations on the ground, as was pointed out this morning, these are oral treaties, at least in, at least in, 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 in the first instance. But they're oral treaties between people of very different circumstances, uh, people speaking different languages, speaking, people having some measure of communication with, with each other, but by no means in a position really to grasp the nuances of a complex set of, of, of relationships, such as those embodied in, a, in, in any treaty dealing with, 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 with issues of land and, uh, and a society. There's just fundamental disconnects there. One also, must also remember that the native world in, in 1850, 1851 was in some considerable turmoil on, on southern Vancouver Islands. Uh, measles and influenza epidemics had just gone through. Approximately 20% of the population had died. Uh, there were raids for, still from the north growing out of the imbalance, something analogous to what Chris was talking about this morning between the north and the south island, the imbalance in the distribution of firearms, this coming out of the, the maritime fur trade. Um, uh, this was not, by no means tranquil, settled uh, native territory. Native people are, are, are in the midst of these tumultuous, difficult uh, circumstances. And just what they make of the treaties, uh, what, what their understandings of them were, exceedingly difficult, uh, exceedingly difficult to say. There's some evidence that they considered them peace treaties. Uh, I think the work that, that Neil Valence is doing may be the next, if he can really get at the issue of what the oral record has to say on these matters, may be the next real advance in understanding, in understanding the, uh, the Douglas uh, treaties. But at the moment, we really don't, we really don't know in, in, in much detail what uh, the, the native understanding of these, uh, of these uh, treaties was. And even on, on, on the non-native side, as, as again was mentioned this morning, people like, uh, like uh, uh, McKay, the fur trader, and, and Blankensop, they held that, that these weren't purchases because the government already owned the land. Uh, they weren't treaties, certainly. They were just means of pacifying uh, native people. On the other hand, uh, probably the most astute observer of these things comes on the scene slightly later is the Indian Reserve Commissioner Gilbert Malcolm Sprout. Gilbert Malcolm Sprout, when he took on that job, made a very thorough survey of, of what had gone on before. And he came to the conclusion that some issue of title was clearly involved. And he thought that Douglas understood that uh, some issue of title was uh, clearly involved with these, uh, with these uh, treaties. But as I say, as oral documents, they're, they're uh, they're hard to decode. And as written documents, and of course, I mean, as Chris was pointing out this morning, you have blank sheets of paper, you have X's, and you have eventually have a template dropped in on these, uh, on, on these, these, these blanks. But what, what really, even, even those words, 
What do they mean? Um, village sites. What is a village site? Nothing is explicit in these, in these treaties. Um, there's no, in the European sense of village, there were no villages here. The winter villages are the closest approximation. But w and so if they're the villages, what winter villages? Is it the winter villages that were occupied in 1850, 1851, eight to 1854 when these treaties were negotiated? Is it sites where there had been, been villages? Is it villages where the Clallam had, some Clallam had just moved across the, str the Strait of Juan de Fuca, arriving a few years before? Are they entitled to, uh, to, uh, to rights because they, they now have, uh, have villages? What villages? What, what does that mean? The, the documents are not, are not clear. Enclosed fields. Very interesting question this morning about enclosed fields. There were no enclosed fields uh, other than those of the Hudson's Bay Company on Vancouver Island in, in, in 1850. The potato had diffused here from Fort Langley after, after 1827, but there were no, there were no enclosed fields. Uh, on the other hand, the concept of the enclosed field, I don't think it comes out of the Hudson's Bay Company, it's very deep in, in British legal thought. Along the eastern seaboard of the United States, the distinction is being made between those people who enclosed their fields, which were the colonists, and, set, and, and, and indigenous people who were also agriculturalists who did not enclose their fields. And the English held that, that this was a, a consequential difference and that those who enclosed their fields were entitled to rights that those who did not enclose their fields uh, were, uh, were not. But, you know, what, what fields? Uh, the fisheries as formerly seems a generous and clear right, but how, how, how clear is it? Does it? Did it mean that if, if a white had a, a, a piece of land held in fee simple, but a stream ran through it, that it was uh, legal for a native person to put a weir on that, on that stream? Did it mean that in a similar fee simple situation, native people could land on a spot on, on the coast where they had always, always landed to say, to process, uh, to process fish? Uh, completely unclear. Uh, what about, um, what about uh, uh, the rights to hunt on, on, on unoccupied land? Well, what is, un what is unoccupied land? Uh, if somebody, uh, to, I mean, by the time you get, you're talking about the, uh, the ENN land grant. The ENN land grant is owned, but is it occupied? Do, do the rights to hunt apply to own, but un, what does unoccupied land mean? See what I mean? There's ambiguity and uncertainty, imprecision lurking everywhere, it seems to me, in these, uh, in these treaties. What begins to get a little clearer is what actually happens on the ground. Um, in some cases, nothing. When the Indian Reserve Commissioners come through here in the late 1870s, they find to their considerable dismay that in some of the, some of the, tr of the treaty arrangements, had, there were still no reserves recorded on the ground. Um, in others there were, but these reserves are, not, are exceedingly small. Here in the, uh, in the among the Nanaimo, um, three reserves, 250 acres. According to the 1856 census, there were about 1,000 people here. One quarter of an acre. One quarter of an acre per person. Not all the reserves, as these small reserves began to be uh, conceded, uh, not all of them were on former uh, village uh, uh, sites. What they are, very often, they're shoehorned in the interstices of the new triangulation of the, uh, the colonial of the colonial uh, land uh, survey. So what you, what you do see though is the beginning of is some of the, of the patterns that will emerge in the reserve system in a later British Columbia. The reserves are going to be small. They're going to be in the territory of the people whose reserves they are. There's not going to be an amalgamation of different groups into a uh, a few large centralized uh, reserves, as there was in many, as there were in many parts of the uh, the United States. Uh, the reserves are going to be held in trust for um, by the government uh, for uh, native people. Um, 
in these ways some of the features of the later reserve system, even in the early 1850s in, uh, in, uh, on Vancouver Island, are beginning to, uh, to come into, uh, into uh, focus. Um, now, what was I going to say next? Um, my old head gets increasingly addled. Um, uh, let me see. Um, it. Uh, what was it? I do have. I do have one scrap of paper here. <laughs> I better look at it. I better look at it. I better look at it. Um, oh yes. Um, so you've got. You've got um, some elements of the larger reserve system coming, in, coming into, into existence, uh, but um, the reserve allocation process stops. In 1854, government, uh, Douglas decides to allocate no more reserves. It's been assumed by many that, his, um, he, that he simply changed his mind. I don't think so, at least not on, not on Vancouver Island. Douglas had, had a very strong sense that it was important to protect settlers, and he had a, a whole, there was a whole technology of power that Douglas had worked out in the fur trade. Indeed, he, he hadn't largely worked it out himself. It was part of the whole, the whole modality of the Western North American fur trade. And um, it involved impressing and, and uh, psychologically dominating Native people in a variety of uh, in a variety of ways, and he felt that to achieve this, he had to maintain a, a system of compact settlement in, on Vancouver Island, and that if settlement were to disperse too far, that he simply wouldn't be able to exercise this sort of theater of power within which uh, he thought uh, the uh, the settlement uh, the safe the non-native settlement of, uh, of uh, Vancouver Island had to proceed. And, and so he, he felt by 1854 that he got the land he needed. Later, after the, the gold rush breaks and settlement is pressing up the island, then Douglas is, is advocating to the colonial office for support for more, uh, more uh, 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 treaties of the sort that he'd, al that he'd already made. The, the model of the Vancouver Island treaties was very much in, in, in place. On the mainland later, and I, I can't get into this, but on the mainland later, Douglas faces a whole different set of, uh, of problems. Uh, the pace of development is frenetic. There's a gold rush uh, uh, in full train, and where it's going to stop is, is, is quite unclear. There's vast reaches of territory. Douglas's resources are limited. The native population, even after the epidemics, is, is large. Douglas doesn't know where to, uh, where to, where to start making, making treaties. And he embarks on an entirely different scheme, which is to grant ample reserves to put aside altogether the, the issue of, uh, of, uh, uh, of title and hope that, that generous reserves conceded early uh, will uh, will do it, and that uh, that what one they would provide for amply for native people during a period of time, perhaps several generations long, which would which in his mind was a time of transition between a native way of life and a and a uh, and a westernized one, which he thought was the inevitable the inevitable eventual consequence of uh, of um, well of native being in in, in British Columbia. But that's, an, that's another, uh, another story. The final things I want to say, and I really, I really am out of, out of time, um, but are, but are, are, are this, uh, and, and I think they're, they're important. Um, theorists in Britain in the eight, as early as the late 1830s held that in colonial settler societies, there were two fundamentally different interests at play that settlers wanted land, and that the land they wanted belonged to native people, and the native people wanted to keep it. The settlers aren't gonna come if they can't get, the, the whole reason for the settlement of these places is to get at their resources, to get at their land. And so there's, 
the, these theorists realized, particularly Herman Merivale at Oxford in the late 1830s, uh, these theorists re, uh, argued that there's an inevitable conflict here, that that conflict would, would uh, eventually lead to war, and that uh, the settlers would win because they, their firepower was, was greater and that there was a responsibility of the colonial office to protect native people. And that it rested with the executive, it rested with the governor, it rested with the, uh, the, colonial, office, the colonial office itself. Now, the Douglas treaties are situated within this dilemma the dilemma of the demands of settlers on the one hand and the demands of native people on the other. And at one level, at one level, the, the Douglas treaties are the answer of a colonial administration to that problem. And what they're basically seeking to do is to achieve the dispossession of native people and to do it in a peace, pe peaceable way. The, the, the Douglas treaties are themselves from the perspective of the, the, the Europeans in British Columbia, in Vancouver Island in the early 1850s, are tools of colonial dispossession. One has to understand that. The other thing one has to understand, I think, is that um, within those tools are some handles that Native people can use and, and have been using and probably can use with a good deal more effect yet. Uh, the, Provisions for hunting rights can be, continue to be argued in various ways through the courts. The provisions for fishing rights can continue to be argued. Perhaps uh, Chris Arnett is right that this is a total, full right to the fishery. And, and beyond all of this is the simple fact that these treaties were made. For all the arguments, for all the ambiguity and the uncertainty in the uh, colonial office, there, the fact that treaties were, that Douglas called them agreements, the fact that land was purchased meant that there was something to purchase. It meant that there was some prior right out there. And the courts have, have held that that is, uh, that that is, uh, is, is so. So what one is dealing with here in the Douglas Treaties is a, a set of colonial documents about dispossession, but colonial documents that provide handles to use against the dispossessors. And they are being used, and they will continue to be used. And some of you in this room will be active users uh, of them. One of the conclusions to which I came as a, as a Set, colonialist settler in British Columbia after working on the book that became uh, Making uh, Native Space was that, sure, we have to work out lives together in this space, but that the balance, the colonial balance between land and resources apportioned to Native people and land and resources apportioned to non-Native people was way out of whack in this province and that that had to be changed. So. Even within, even within these documents that are themselves active agents of colonial dispossession, there, uh, there are elements for resistance and change. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Our next speaker is Louise Mandel. Uh, some of you will have heard her when she spoke at VIU here a couple of months ago. Louise is a lawyer, a partner in um, Mandel Pinder, and uh, semi-retired or trying to be retired or something like that. So anyway, Louise, thank you. Is it possible to get... Chiefs, elders, leaders, scholars, friends, I want to begin by acknowledging the Sinemuk for hosting this important conversation and to thank, um, to thank Chief George Knox for the beautiful, Chief George Hunt for the prayer that got us started in such a beautiful way today and the words of so many people who are contributing to this conversation. Um, I wanted to begin with the rules governing the Crown's assertion of sovereignty in British Columbia, which was the Royal Proclamation, which stated international law 
governing European nations and their dealings with indigenous nations overseas. And the royal proclamation was absorbed into national law, including the common law, and so into Canadian law. And it reflected a century of crown practice, which had been agreed to by indigenous nations who sanctified it by the Treaty of Niagara. And the Royal Proclamation was pretty simple. It said that Indigenous nations should not be molested or disturbed in the parts of the Dominion which not having been ceded to or purchased by us are reserved for them. It set up a process for treaty making and this paved a constitutional foundation for British colonization, not by warfare, but based on a compact to conclude treaties and then the incremental perfection of crown title and sovereignty through treaties. And this endowed Canada with an indigenous foundation based on the rule of law. And so it was in this context that the Douglas treaties were concluded. And when the Constitution, the BNA Act came back from Britain, section 9124 placed Indians and lands reserved for Indians, which included your treaty rights, beyond the power of the province. Now, I wanted to then talk about the question that was raised by the speakers this morning. Well, how is it that treaty and non-treaty um, peoples find themselves in the same place, which is dispossessed and having their lands stolen by crown governments. And I want to um, suggest that the crown governments basically skirt, skirted the rule of law. That what happened is that they began behavior which is characterized by the dominance of crown governance. Denial, dispossession, divide and conquer, delay in challenging Canada and British Columbia's sovereignty assertions. These deadly deeds gave expression to the prejudice and stereotypes which were embedded in the doctrine of discovery, which we now know has been repudiated at the international level by the World Council of Churches, by the Royal Commission. It's a racially based legal fiction which is more entrenched in our political and legal culture than the foundational compact which, which makes up the constitutional framework of our country. And the doctrine of discovery presumes the superiority of these Western colonizers and the right to take possession of the territories of who they deem to be primitive or heathen people that are presumed to be without laws. And this origin tr traces back several centuries to the early colonizers who had um, a theory of a four-scale set of social development where primitive, pastoral, agricultural, commercial people ascend in their stages of civilization with Western societies at the very top and indigenous peoples at the very bottom. And so the cultural imagination of the settler government was that they were of a superior race who brought civilization and benefits to the inferior peoples. And so so in spite of the treaties, what you have very soon after British Columbia became a province, in spite of 9124 of the Constitution and Section 109 that said the provinces, lands, mines, minerals and royalties are available to them as a source of revenue once Aboriginal title has been dealt with, which didn't happen in British Columbia, you've got the province claiming exclusive ownership and jurisdiction in legislation and policies and in the government negotiation mandates that it brings to the treaty table, and you have the federal government pursuing assimilation goals through the Indian Act. And one of those goals prevented Indigenous people from going to court or for lawyers to even help them to do that, to address this basic race, racist um, cultural imagination, which was contrary to the rule of law. So I wanted to then turn now to the Douglas Treaty litigation and take my hat off to Mr. White and Mr. Bob, who stood up in 1964. And you know, I, one of the things which is interesting about the White and Bob case is that it was the first time that we had title recognition. They went and argued in the courts that the treaty was a recognition of title. And they also argued that this was a treaty. And you had the Crown arguing, no, it's not. And in the end, 
again, the court relied on 9124 and said that the treaty was right within the definition of the exemption to the Indian Act, which prevented the Provincial Wildlife um, Act from applying to them. So then I come in. I'm, I'm, I, White and Bob had been decided when I became a lawyer, and I had the great honor and privilege of representing the Saanich people in a series of cases involving the Douglas Treaties. And I begin with Regina versus Bartleman, a case out of Vancouver, out of the Tartlip, and also Doug August from Halalt. And again, it was a hunting case. You'd think after White and Bob, the Crown might have acknowledged the hunting rights and made space for their operation, but they're still charging people. And in the Bartleman case, there was a number of important interpretive um, principles which were decided. One of them was um, indigenous laws, because Mr. Bartleman was hunting in the territory which was, of, which was Halalt territory, but he was there because his cousin had, of course, given him permission to hunt there. He was hunting with his cousin. And the Crown argued, well, he's not hunting in the treaty territory, whatever that was, and the court accepted the argument that the treaty right includes the right to hunt according to the laws. So even though it was in halal territory, it was a right under the treaty. And then the Crown said, well, the treaty says um, that the, they interpreted the treaty as based on the 12 miles that are reflected in the treaty as the crow flies, and said, well, he's hunting out of this 12-mile area that's reflected in the treaty. And the court, the court didn't accept that and said, no, he can hunt. The hunting in the treaty involves the entire traditional territory, not the small area which the Crown pointed to as being the territory of the treaty. Well, then the Crown said, but he's hunting in fee simple land. That can't be right. And the court didn't agree and said, the access to the treaty allows the hunting to take place on fee simple land, in this case where there was no fences and it was, there was no reason why the hunting couldn't continue as formerly. And so one of the um, interesting things out of the Bartleman case um, came out of a question this morning about the X's that were on the treaty. And Mr. Justice Lampert at the Court of Appeals said, look, I'm finding that this hunting right continues. I'm finding the Provincial Wildlife Act um, is, is beyond its power to infringe it. Um, what I'm not answering is whether these treaties are extinguishment treaties. That question wasn't before me. And he went back to the X's on the document. He went back to the question of not knowing anything about the interpretation of the treaty. And he said, this isn't an issue which I'm going to answer. I'm le this is an open question which remains an open question still to be tried. Well, shortly thereafter, the um, province authorized um, permits to this company called Sanichton Marina to build a marina in front of the say village right out there in Sanichton Bay. And I wanted to say that the lesson for this case may be that while the province may provide the permits, it's the First Nations that provided the certainty because that, was, that marina was not going to be built as long as the Saanich people had anything to do with it. And Earl Claxton Jr. actually got inside the um, dredger as this dredger was going to claw down and pull up an eel bed grass eelgrass bed, which housed the ancient crab fishery of the people. And he was going to go down with the dredger if it was going to pull up the eelgrass. And we ended up stopping the dredger by going to court, first of all, getting an injunction, and secondly and finally getting an, a permanent injunction. And I wanted to say a few things about some of the highlights of that case. One of them was um, the fact that the very first argument the Crown raised was this isn't a treaty. And we had to argue the same argument that they argued in the White and Bob case. So here it is 120 years later, after the treaty had been concluded, and the Crown governments are still arguing that there's no treaty. And what that means is that there's been no implementation of the treaty for 120 years, because they're still denying that it ever existed. And after we got through that hurdle, 
We then got into the question, which ultimately resolved the case, of the argument that the Crown said, well, the right to fish is formerly, it's just the opportunity to fish. So we're going to plant another bed of eel grass somewhere else, no net loss, there's ultimately going to be the same number of crabs, and the, and the Tseut people can go and take their boats out and get the fishery done somewhere else. And what the court said is that the right to carry on your fishery as formerly includes the right to protect the habitat that the fish came from. You can't destroy the habitat without interfering with the right. And that's an important case now when we think about Enbridge and the changes now to the Fisheries Act where the government has basically authorized um, the destruction of fish habitat, which they say can be done if the fish species aren't vital to the commercial or the sports fishery or the what they call the aboriginal fishery. And we were successful in getting a permanent injunction in that case. And I wanted to um, pay special thanks at this point to the late Philip Paul and Earl Claxton Sr. During cross-examination in that case, one of the witnesses was getting pushed around by Crown Council, and we took a break, and those two gentlemen said something which has guided me for the rest of my legal life. He's, they said, when you talk about the treaty, always talk about the treaty with love. And it just completely changed the energy of the courtroom. There was just from there on in such a gorgeous relationship of the peoples to their fisheries, which came out in the evidence, which came out in the argument, and ultimately which affected the, which affected the judge in, in our favor. The next um, series of cases were about village sites and enclosed fields. And those of you who have asked the question, what does it mean, the answer is that there's no meaning in law yet. Obviously, we've heard uh, that there's been some discussion in some cases that enclosed fields should translate to being the areas of land which are required in order to feed the, with the resources needed to feed the village sites. This is the kind of definition which has come out, um, for example, in the Chilcotin case. But we don't really have a definition of it yet. But we've got, we've got cases where people have pushed the envelope and and one of them, again, is in the Gowdy Road site, um, again at the Tsartla Preserve, where they wanted to build a school on lands just outside the present reserve boundaries. And there, the, there was, again, I see the late Philip Paul there with his lawn chair and many others who weren't going to let the school be built. And the result, ultimately, was that the lands got re-included in the um, reserve. And the argument that we made was that the village sites had not included all the lands which ought to have been included in village sites and certainly not the enclosed fields. In fact, what I said earlier about indigenous people with treaties being treated like non-indigenous people is that in spite of the treaties which guaranteed the protection of village sites, the reserve commissions came along with the same instructions for treaty people and as, as not. There was in many cases smallpox where the population at the time of the treaty was significantly greater than those when the reserves were actually set up. So in the case of the Gowdy Road site, we said that the village site hasn't finished its completion. It's not what it ought to have been, and that land was ultimately made part of the reserve. And to the Kwaguth people, I take off my hat because they fought the same fight in Deer Island, a beautiful, a beautiful burial island with a multi um, species and environmental and ecological systems. So there's so many places there for fishing and for other resource harvesting right at the doorstep of the village. And again, the fight there was about this land ought to have been included in our villages and was not. So for those of you thinking about, um, as Chloe Ostrov was talking about this morning, issues that remain alive and yet to be fought and interpreted on the Douglas Treaties, the village sites are our, our major unfinished business. And I'd like to um, finally talk about the Morrison Olson case. Um, we were in London during the time when the Constitution was patriated, um, opposing patriation on behalf of the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs 
even after Section 35 was included, Section 35 did not carry the consent of not only the Indigenous nations in British Columbia, but clear across the province. So Section 35 gets brought into the Constitution, and not only does that happen, but shortly thereafter, the wildlife officers set up a decoy and start to try to trap the Saanich hunters for night hunting on the basis that Section 35 allows them to justify an interference based on safety, public safety. And I have to say, you'll recall when we talked about White and Bob and Bartleman, it was the province who had no jurisdiction. And when we fought the Morrison Olson case, we were directed by the um, community to go up to the Supreme Court of Canada and say, notwithstanding Section 35, the province has no jurisdiction over our hunting rights. And what was pretty interesting about that case was that the we saw the doctrine of discovery disguised in arguments of the Crown, who came back and said, well, if it's not our laws governing safety, there's a juridical vacuum out there. And we, of course, argued the beautiful Saanich laws, which not only have controlled safety of the hunters for millennium, the Crown couldn't point to one incident where there was actually an accident. And at the end of the day, the court ruled that the province has no jurisdiction over the hunting rights, not even justification jurisdiction, that if the Crown has to justify an interference, let the federal government try. And you know, one of the things which I loved about that decision, ultimately, was that there's never been a federal law in place governing hunting. The only laws which have ever always been in place are the indigenous laws, and those are the laws laws which remain in place today. The province has no jurisdiction over treaty rights. They can't interfere with it. So you think that after all this litigation, we should be doing quite well. But turning denial around is very difficult. The culture of denial runs deep. It's like a rock. And the court's words have been like water around the, the rock. As long as denial is working, there will be those who keep the rock there. And that's what's happening. It's very hard to remove denial from our culture. The fox in the hen house is not a vegetarian. So I'd just like to leave you with some brief words. This isn't the implementation panel, but I did want to, I did want to leave you with this. And that is that we have a beautiful opportunity in our country through the laws of the indigenous people, the transformative possibilities where the priceless contribution of these rich cultures and the breadth and depth of their knowledge ha have the legal constitutional space to actually help us steward the land, to choose a future that is sustainably managing the resources so that we have economics which are based on healthy oceans and healthy forest ecosystems. When we went to court in the Delgamook case and later with the Campbell case, the Supreme Court of Canada has confirmed that Indigenous laws pre-existed and survived the assertion of Crown sovereignty, they've never been extinguished, and they find a home in Section 35. In the Campbell case, the court said that jurisdiction is not exhaustively divided between the federal and provincial governments. In the Morrison Olson case, we've seen indigenous laws govern the hunting and they can govern all of the treaty rights beyond the power of the province. It's the transformative possibility of this country which will allow indigenous nations, those with treaties and those without, to achieve self-determination within confederation. But, you know, we've got to find a way to move the rock. And Einstein said that nothing changes until something moves. And so we've got to ask ourselves, well, what is it that we can each move to make some change happen? And I wanted to say that to the indigenous people, your ceremonies and the laws and the, your indigenous jurisdiction exercised, as you approach that 
from a stronger place of unity and from a stronger place of recognition, then we're going to see something move. So long as you continue to do as your ancestors have always done, but do that now in a position where you know that it's one of the places you have to move in order to move this particular rock, I say thank you so much to you and I take my hat off to the next generation who has their task cut out for them. And for all of us in the room, change of consciousness is also a, is also a change. We, if your ch consciousness is changing, that you don't accept crap, the deadly deeds, denial, dispossession, delay, divide, all of the de dominance, all of the de deadly deeds that actually form part of the, the political status quo as we speak, then, then thank you for standing up, thank you for teaching your children, and thank you for doing what you can do within the world that you influence. So I just wanted to, at this point, um, conclude by thanking you all for listening, whether you agreed with me or not, and also especially thanking, and I take my hands off to the Treaty First Nations for all the joy and the beauty that you've brought to this world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our, uh, our next speaker is Raymond Frogner, who's uh, an archivist with uh, the British Columbia Archives. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to express my gratitude to the Sinema First Nation for allowing me to speak here tonight, or this afternoon. Um, it occurred to me while I was listening to um, the excellent, excellent speakers that we've had so far today that um, like the Douglas Treaties, I'm sort of living a kind of personal archival identity crisis. Um, as an archivist, as an archivist, I'm neither a lawyer nor an historical researcher. Um, and although born and raised in white community of Port Alberni, um, my mom was raised as a Cree girl um, in uh, Duncan Reserve in Treaty 8 territory. Um, so with that theme of uh, archival identity crisis, I wish to offer an archival interpretation of the bound register of records often referred to as the Douglas Treaties, Vancouver Island Treaties, or as written on the cover of the document itself, Register of Land Purchases from the Indians. The archival life cycle of these records, their creation, custodial history, and preservation tell us much about the difficult relationship between public archives and the process of colonialism. To consider the record's provenance introduces questions of archival method into a debate dominated by issues of historical and legal analysis. Although First Nations and the legal profession have relied closely on archives in the pursuit of Aboriginal rights, from the perspective of the law office, the archival role in Aboriginal rights litigation is passive and lacking theory. But there is an important archival role to apply to the meaning of these treaty documents. Archivists have an important contribution to make to questions concerning the historical consciousness of our society, the relativity of evidence, and the value of our cultural memory. To appreciate the archival understanding of such colonial records, we should recall that for millennia records have been created to underscore rights. And our most important archival concepts, the authenticity and reliability of records, developed to resolve contested evidence of rights and authority. To quote an archival scholar, the first archival definition of records clearly referred to records as proof of rights. Today, we look more critically than ever at the powerful effect of our cultural institutions on our social identity. We place a vital social role on our museums, art galleries, historical monuments, and even zoos. But while some writers are examining the philosophical meaning of quote unquote, the archives, this is almost always done without an understanding of archives as real institutions, as a real profession, in fact, the second oldest, with, some of its, own, with its own set of theories and practices. My point is by taking a closer look at the making, interpretation, and preservation of the Douglas Treaties from an archival perspective, we can gain fresh insights into courtroom struggles over Aboriginal rights the cultural value of Aboriginal oral traditions, and a need to bring an Indigenous presence into our public archives. In questioning the archival record of first contact on the west coast of BC, historian Daniel Clayton remarked that colonialism is as much an arbitrary and variously conceived process of inscription as it is a process of physical occupation and domination. While he doesn't directly acknowledge it, Clayton is suggesting the colonial record be challenged for its lack of archival authenticity and reliability. An archival record is judged authentic when it is truly what it claims to be. A record acquires this quality by the trustworthy manner it's accessed and preserved over time. An archival record possesses reliability if its content is confirmed to be true. 
How actors interact in their social and cultural context to create a record defines its reliability. Over centuries, archivists have devoted considerable thought and practice to create trustworthy, i.e. authentic and reliable records. With these thoughts in mind, I first wish to comment on the archival reliability of the Douglas Treaties. As we know, between 1850 and 1854, Douglas arranged for the creation of 14 treaties covering various tracts of Vancouver Island. Douglas required Aboriginal land to fulfill the HBC's chartered responsibility to promote white settlement on Vancouver Island. He wrote HBC Secretary Archibald Barclay in 1849, arguing it was in the interest of quote unquote justice and harmony to recognize indigenous rights to villages and other locations of common use. Barclay replied with instructions to quote purchase unquote required lands not physically settled or cultivated, a much less generous approach. He also sent Douglas register books to record land purchases to which Douglas replied. I observed the instructions respecting the registers to be kept there but confess with regret I do not understand them, as I have never seen any books of the kind except the simple forms of registering lands used in the Columbia. I have therefore to beg that a pro forma entry for each of the books, original sale book and division sale book, may be sent out, as this will save much future trouble and inconvenience. Douglas is here explaining his inexperience and unfamiliarity with the process of documenting land tenure, the essential colonial project of turning earth into property. Douglas was equally confused over the documentation of land tenure for white settlers and more than once requested the colonial office's legal opinion on this topic. It is in part his poor understanding of documenting tenure that resulted in such odd documents. Time does not permit a detailed analysis of the many curious elements of the treaties. Suffice to say, the inconsistent nature of the documentary elements, the unusual numbering, the odd adhesions of signatures, the signed X's written in a single hand, I'll call into question the creative process and ultimately the archival reliability of the treaties. Archivists study elements of a record's form and content as a window to its formative context. The political, legal, and economic structures, culture, and myths that form an integral part of the written document. From this view, I can sum up the Vancouver Island Treaties reliability with an old archival adage, a document is only as reliable as the process which created it, or as Wilson Duff described them, innocent legal fictions. Let us now turn to the archival authenticity of the treaties. To promote authentic records, an archives will normally keep careful accession files, logging with contextual detail exactly what crosses the archival threshold. This metaphor is significant. Only records archivists have appraised to possess enduring value can enter the archives. The earliest archivists at the BC archives, Hosey, Schofield, Lamb, recorded after a fashion accession files, and Lamb introduced the first accession registers. But Willard Ireland, the archivist who testified to the authenticity of the Douglas Treaties at the famous 1963 R.V. White and Bob trial, did not continue this practice. At trial, Thomas Burgess, the defense counsel for Messrs. Bob and White of the Sinemu First Nation, called Ireland as an expert witness concerning the treaties. Mr. Burgess has elsewhere written that he first learned of the treaties from Sinemu elders while preparing for trial, and after finding the, trans the transcribed version in government sessional papers, asked Ireland for details of the original. Ireland confirmed the archives held the originals. What never seems to have been discussed is whether Ireland knew how the registers found their way into the archives. Had anyone asked Ireland this simple question of archival practice, he may not have been able to answer. The custodial history of, th of this treaty register is in fact spotty. The treaties were written and originally stored at Fort Victoria, at least most of them. H.L. Langevin's report of British Columbia, an 1872 federal government document, referenced the treaties under the title Memorandum of Treaties Made with Indian Tribes for Purchase of Their Lands. The report included excerpts from the main text of the agreements. They were again referenced in a federal report titled Report of the Superintendent on Indian Affairs for British Columbia for 1872 and 1873. And we, know, we all know of the controversy surrounding the BC government's 1875 publication titled Papers Connected with the Indian Land Question, 1850 to 1875. This publication included fully transcribed and slightly edited versions of each original treaty. Until the R.V. White and Bob trial in 1963, the references to treaties are generally made to this publication. And it is well known government officials prevented Aboriginal access to even this document on more than one occasion. For example, we know the spokesman of the Allied Indian Tribes of BC tried unsuccessfully to acquire a copy of the papers during the 1927 parliamentary hearings into land claims. But in this case, as in others, we learn little or nothing of the treaty's custodial history. 
In fact, only three, week, three weeks ago, in conversation with Chief Douglas White, I learned that in 1963, Ireland brought the register to Nanaimo to show the Sunaimo First Nation as part of the discussions for the White and Bob trial. For me, this is the first direct mention of the original's location since 1875. Most likely the trees were in a government office, likely crown lands, until transferred in, in one of the many bulk transfers of government records in the early to mid 20th century. To speculate, in 1933, Jay Housey, provincial librarian and archivist, wrote Deputy Secretary Walker, both Mr. Gosnell and Mr. Schofield, provincial archivists between the years 1908 and 1919, were allowed to remove from various government departments quantities of documents of the old colonial days for the better preservation and treatment. These have been carefully indexed and made accessible. It's my personal view, although some of my colleagues have others, that it's in this 11-year window that the treaties entered the archives. All of this raises two points in a difficult relationship between archives and the process of colonialism. First, the contemporary archivists performing archival appraisal of colonial records did not view the treaties as holding such value that they merited a detailed accession record. Second, until recently, history and jurisprudence privileged textual sources of evidence over artifacts and oral traditions to the point where they are not held to the same value or critical analysis. Referring first to appraisal, it's important to note that early archivists of British Columbia were historians of one sort or another. They were likely aware of the bound registers of treaties, but they were preoccupied with creating in the early 20th century a provincial archives to support narrative local, local histories of BC, histories concerned with the identity and meaning of European settlement. Looking at the accession files and annual reports of this period, the archival acquisitions do itemize colonial correspondence down to the individual letter. The archival appraisal of this period focused on collecting materials to create the identity of a new settler society emerging from the frontier of colonial empire. The making of this new provincial identity necessarily includes the archivization of a particular kind of knowledge, one which did not privilege records of Aboriginal peoples. Finally, I wish to consider the privileged position of textual records in the historical conscience and jurisprudence of BC. Mr. Ireland also played a role, an important role, as expert archival witness in the celebrated R.V. Calder trial of 1973. The trial considered 26 textual exhibits, most of which came from the BC archives. Exhibit six consisted of minutes of the Joint Committee of Proceedings on Aboriginal Affairs from 1912. The trial transcripts record confusion, confusion over the version to be admitted at trial. Representing the Attorney General's office, Attorney D.M. Brown brought the office's four-volume copy. However, the Attorney General's office did not want to release the report to the court's possession, as it was their only copy. Mr. Berger offered his annotated pages by, made by the archives staff from a microfilm copy held at the archives. Mr. Berger explains these selected pages from the report document, quote, the evidence we are concerned with, unquote. And although he has marked it up with his own notes, the notes are, quote, unquote, not prejudicial. Mr. Brown rightly questions the archival propriety of referencing multiple copies at trial, one being a marked copy of excerpts of only several pages requested and annotated by the appellant's lawyer. The trial transcript then records Justice Gold declaring, we'll discuss this over lunch. The transcript makes no further reference to the issue. Each of the Vancouver Island treaties possess unique oral histories passed down through generations of First Nation elders. However, unlike the admissibility at trial of government documents, the admissibility of Aboriginal oral testimonies is not discussed over lunch. Aboriginal oral traditions are intensely critiqued for admissibility and weight at trial. And it was not until the Delgamuk trial of 97 that oral testimonies were admitted at all. Since Delgamuk, the debate has continued over how to recognize Aboriginal oral testimonies with respect and weight at court. As we have heard, Canadian courts have not always applied the same strict standards of reliability and authenticity to government records as used on Aboriginal oral traditions. These standards are vitally important when one considers Aboriginal oral traditions are most often used to prove the existence of an Aboriginal society at court. Recent courts have referred to oral traditions as evidence possessing unique qualities. Jurists suggest that new legal paradigms flowing from the unique historic presence of Aboriginal peoples in North America are required to admit this testimony under common law rules of evidence. But this perspective is not translated into archival work. Archivists continue to apply 19th century models of trustworthy textual evidence to appraise traditional memories of Aboriginal identity. Our archival paradigms lack the sovereign cultural authority to fully account for the Aboriginal memory of colonial experience. Public archives need to bring Aboriginal participation into the contextual representation of the colonial archival record. 
And I'll be more than happy to discuss how that could be done, time not permitting at the moment. Uh, the documents that selectively and arbitrarily found their way into public archives to describe the collision of colonial era societies cannot resolve the destiny of these societies. But in their faithful and accountable representation, they may provide insight and support for a multicultural constitutional identity. Our mission as archivists is not to seek truth, but to preserve truthfully those materials in which others may seek it. Writing in this period when I believe the Vancouver Island treaties found their way into the BC archives, Dominion archivist Sir Arthur Doughty described the mission of the then public archives of Canada to preserve the documentary heritage of our nation as a quote unquote noble dream. Similarly, writing in, on archival rights in his R.V. Cote decision, a Supreme Court of Canada justice spoke of the quote unquote noble purpose envisioned in section 35 of the, colonial, of the Canada Act. Still missing from our noble postures of legal purpose and archival value is the respected and genu genuine memory of First Nations colonial experience. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Our uh, final speaker is uh, Dr. John Lutz, an historian from the University of Victoria. Something will appear. Great, thank you. Well, um, chiefs, elders, and all of those uh, of you gathered here with us to learn from each other, I want to start by thanking the Sanaimok First Nation and also Vancouver Island University for hosting this really important conference and, and also for the honor of inviting me to uh, share a few words with you and hopefully stimulate some discussion with you. I want to, I want to start um, by talking about, uh, I was going to start by talking about the Douglas Treaties, but His Honor Stephen Point's point, uh, the point that he made uh, early this morning by calling them Douglas Treaties, we give way too much credence to the role that Governor Douglas played and not enough attention to the role that First Nations played in the creation of those treaties. So I think maybe for the purposes of today, I'll call them the Salish Kwakwakiwak Treaties. So as, as Cole Harris has pointed out uh, uh, very ably a few moments ago, these treaties and the discussion around them are full of ambiguity. But amongst all this ambiguity, there's one glaring contradiction. James Douglas wrote shortly after concluding the treaties that he would have preferred to offer annual treaty annuities, annual payments to the First Nations instead of a lump sum. And he said that this proposal was turned down by the Lakwangan, the, the, the um, Songhees CM, the Songhees chiefs. Now, David Latasse, who said he was also there, uh, uh, says that the First Nations understood that, in fact, this was just a first installment, that the payments that they got from uh, James Douglas at the treaty meeting was a first installment, and he said that the First Nations expected continuing payments, in fact, annual payments, what Latasse called rent. So my presentation is going to explore uh, this contradiction and try and draw out from this contradiction what we might learn about the interpretations of treaties. But before I do this, I want to actually take a small pause and give you a short advertorial. And I want to introduce a few projects uh, that would allow all of you here, I think, to access some of the documents that we've been talking about today and have recently been made available online. So take a little pause for an advertorial here. I want to introduce uh, the Fort Victoria Journals Online, which we just launched uh, last week, last Wednesday at the University of Victoria. This is a project of the University of Victoria history class and a uh, community scholar, Graham Brazier from Denman Island. And what we've done here is taken the original handwritten diaries or journals from the period that the treaty was signed. And this is what they look like on the top, and this is what they look like uh, once they've been digitized and transcribed, and make them available to all of you if you want to go look. And as Neil Valance said uh, this morning, this, these, these documents contain the first references to the Salish Kwakwakiwak treaties. Also on the website, you'll find some uh, textual documents, some other uh, documents about uh, contemporary observers who were there at the same time, as well as some interpretive essays, including one from Neil himself. So the second is an ongoing digitization project uh, uh, trying to make the colonial dispatches available to all of you. And the colonial dispatches was the correspondence between the governors of Vancouver Island and, and British Columbia and the colonial office in England. Uh, and so this is all the instructions that Douglas got from the colonial office and the other governors, Blanchard and Kennedy and Seymour and others. Um, also, uh, the responses of the governors, and the governors were told to report on everything of interest in the colonies. 
And so year by year, year, we're digitizing these correspondence. We started in 1846, and when I say we, I'm mostly speaking about the UVic Library and the uh, Humanities Computing Media Center at UVic, and, uh, and the work of Chris Petter, who's here in the audience today. And so far, we've worked our way up to 1860 as we uh, go, and of course, we, uh, we want to go to 1871, which is the Confederation with Canada, the end of this correspondence. So we're raising money, trying to raise money for uh, digitization the last of the series, and I'll be passing a hat around after the talk. Third, um, that's uh, what's in the digital dispatch. This gives you an idea of kind of the transformations we've done, and we've made the originals available online. Third is uh, the launch of two a series of uh, map collections that we also made last week at UVic, and this is a, a project of the UVic libraries, uh, really under the uh, direction of Chris Petter, Special Collections Librarian at UVic. And what we've done is uh, gone to the uh, National Archives of England and digitized all of the maps that relate to Colonial BC, uh, over 240 maps. Those are available in high definition for you to browse and look at, including many maps of this period. And finally, We've gone to the Hudson's Bay Company archives and digitized over 100 of the most important uh, Hudson's Bay Company archives maps, including and just a few samples here uh, of our local, uh, where we are right now, uh, this 1852 map of Nanaimo by uh, uh, Joseph Pemberton, and uh, here's an example of an 1863 map. And finally, um, as part of the Colonial Dispatches Project and with funding from the BC Treaty Commission, we've taken uh, the, uh, the correspondence, the governor's correspondence, and turned them into lesson plans for grades uh, 5 to 12, including one lesson plan uh, explicitly devoted to the Douglas Treaties. So I've left a handout in the lobby uh, at the back for anyone who wants to pick up the URLs, the website addresses for, for those projects. So this is the end of the commercial break. So, Thank you. <laughs> and before I start my talk in earnest, I want to ask you to excuse me because I, I'm going to be speaking as if I've learned a little bit about Coast Salish uh, culture. And if I, if, I, if I do so, it's only because I've learned from some very patient Huelmuk teachers, including Nahahatsi, Hey Taluk, Siemchis, and others, mostly Stalo elders, whom I work with quite closely. And I'm merely passing along what they have taught me when I talk uh, in that way. If I speak as if I little, know a little bit about European customs in the 19th century, much of what I know comes from my Hualitam teachers, including those on the stage here. Cole Harris, for example, uh, Jim Miller this morning, Hamar Foster, Bruce Miller, John McLaren, and Michael Ash, and others, of course. So what I'm going to try and do in my talk is, is take a little, uh, my, a little bit of know something that I've learned from both of these kinds of teachings and bring them together. So back to this contradiction where I want to start and end. In his letter of May 16, 1850, James Douglas reports to Archibald Barclay, and I think this has been quoted earlier today, so I won't dwell on this too much, but he proposed they wanted to pay a series of payments to be made annually. But the proposal was so generally disliked that I yielded to their wishes and paid the sum at once. Well, in his 1934 reminiscence of the event, C.M. David Latasse states that Native people were shrewd bargainers and that such a small sum of the blankets that were paid would never be sufficient to purchase their land. And he says, we all understood that similar gifts would be made each year, what is now called rent. Was one of them lying? Was one of them misremembering? Well, possibly, but for the reasons I'm going to lay out, not necessarily. This is a classic problem in history. Two competing versions of the same event, and we have to decide which is more credible. Typically, uh, this is a case that calls for something that, that, that I call a new ethno-history. Typically, ethno-history has been uh, when academics take kind of a, uh, an academic lens and apply it to First Nations and, and kind of investigate their customs and their practices and their rituals under a bit of a magnifying glass or a microscope. The new ethno-history, well, we do that too, but we take that same magnifying glass and start to turn our attention also on the rituals and the utterances and the um, uh, meanings behind the utterances of the colonialists. So we look at both with a critical but empathetic eye. Well, so looking at both and starting with Douglas, there doesn't seem to be any reason for Douglas to have lied about the question of annuities. Uh, why would he make up the statement? Douglas, in fact, in other places, reasoned that if he paid the Songhees or Lekwungen people in advance, then, then he would have no, if you like, um, uh, club to hold over their heads. And he was afraid that they would come back to him and ask for second payments. Uh, 
uh, he thought if he paid them annually, he could withhold treaty payments and thereby have a little more power. So I have no reason to doubt Douglas's statement. Now, while Douglas wrote his statement down about two weeks after the treaties were signed, David Latasse's account was recorded a long time later, 84 years later. And although Latasse says he was 105 years old at the time, and so would have been about 21 at the time of the events, this may have been an exaggeration. Genealogical research suggests that actually David was more likely to be in his 80s in 1934. And if he was present at the events, he was an infant. So rather than an eyewitness account, I think we should treat David Latasse's account as an oral history account. And given that, well, maybe he prevaricated about his age a little bit and a long time had passed, perhaps we have reasons to doubt the reliability of his story. But I actually think there are reasons to think it's a reliable one too. First, while the rest of Latasse's accounts don't exactly coincide with Douglas's and the others, in fact, they, they don't coincide, but they're not inconsistent with uh, the other reports. Second, as a CM of his community, Latasse was well steeped in the history of the Douglas Treaties. He would have been taught from a very young age exactly what the community story was. And he, um, the rest of his story jives with what, what else we know. So why would he get this one piece wrong? And, and when he made his statements in 1934, what did he have to gain by making that kind of a statement? So I'm inclined to see his statement as reliable too. So drawing on my colleagues uh, who have spoken before me, but also my colleague Michael Ash, who I don't think is here, who has done a lot of work on the number treaties, I think we can find a plausible explanation that reconciles both of these statements. And, and here I want to echo, I guess, the point that several people made this morning, and, and really I think is the key point of my presentation. What we have to understand is the Douglas treaties were the treaties that James Douglas wrote down. The agreement that Douglas made with the First Nations, if you like, the Salish Kwakwakiwak treaties, were, was an oral treaty. And the written treaties are not the oral treaty, and all the written treaty can do is point to some of the elements that might have been included in the oral treaty. First Nations never had an opportunity to review the written treaty, never had an opportunity to say, oh yeah, that's what we agreed to. So I don't think we can take the text, the written text, I, I think this is the big kind of trap we can fall into by thinking of the written text as the treaty. They are not the treaty. They are a one man's view, or at least a collective uh, partisan view of what was said. But we know that from uh, the evidence that actually been presented earlier today, the, the elements of the treaties were already in Douglas's mind before he met with First Nations. He wrote in 1849 saying that we should set aside their villages and their enclosed fields. Barclay writes back in 1850 before the settlement, yeah, that's what you should do. That's exactly what the treaties say. The only indication that Douglas had had a conversation with First Nations, and by the way, he does say that he had considerable discussion over the treaty process. The only indication we know that he had a discussion was in this one line where he says they rejected the annuities. Otherwise, it's what Douglas went into the negotiations with and it's what got written down on the treaties when they came out. So we have to think of these treaties as an oral agreement and we have to look for the pointers to tell us what was in that oral agreement and the written Douglas treaties are only part of that. The second key point, and this again comes from Michael Ash, is that treaties like contracts have no validity unless there is a, a meeting of minds, a common understanding about what is being agreed to. There's no doubt from the reports of both parties that there was some kind of agreement reached in these uh, treaties. But I believe uh, here and now, as I've argued more fully in my book called McCook, A New History of Average and White Relations, that there was a lot of room for mutual understanding. Sure, a lot of things were understood between First Nations and, and uh, settlers, but there was also enormous spaces of ambiguity where Native and settler could think they had come to a meeting of minds, but actually misunderstood each other. So the dispute about the idea of an annual versus a lump sum payment allows us a chance to get at the nature of the real oral contract and to see if there were some misunderstandings, real misunderstandings embedded in it. So Douglas tells us, and now I'm quoting from him, I summoned to a conference the chiefs and influential men of the Songhees tribe, that's the end of the quote, and had a long discussion. He says he proposed annual payments. Presumably somebody asked him, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What kind of payments are you gonna offer us? Well, in the end, we know what the lump sum was. It was 371 blankets. That was the lump sum payment for the, for the nine uh, Douglas uh, treaties in Victoria, the nine Salish Kwakwakwa treaties. Presumably, if he was offering an annual payment, he was only offering a fraction of that. What, 40 blankets a year? 20 blankets a year? 
Presumably, these payments would have gone just to the CM because uh, in, the, uh, in the treaty was finally negotiated, every head of family got three blankets, but 20 or 30 blankets wouldn't go around. So you can see that, you know, whatever was going on here, that proposal wouldn't have gone over well with the, with the Lekwungen. Douglas described the event as a conference, but David Latasse suggested the Salish interpretation. Latasse said that for weeks in advance, the party, as he called it, was a talk of all the encampments within 80 miles of Victoria. On the appointed day, the Lekwungen and their neighbors assembled on Beacon Hill overlooking Fort Victoria. The HPC men distributed hard biscuits smeared with the molasses and gave away other foods. Governor Douglas was dressed in his coat of blue with gold shoulder pieces, gold trim. He gave a salute to the queen and then, now I'm quoting from uh, Latasse. Whoops, uh, that's, uh, this is actually a gathering of the song. He's in 1848, that slide is just sort of, and actually Chialfuk, the chief of the, uh, of the song, he's in that slide. But this is what, uh, what La, David Latasse reports. Uh, and I have a fuller quote here. Douglas stressed the desire of the white man to be friends with the tribes. He assured the chiefs that trade and furs with the peaceful use was, with enough land to grow food were the only reason for the establishment of the settlement. His statement was welcomed by the peace-loving tribes whose view of the settlement, had it been voiced, would have been that there was lots of land and no harm would come from letting the whites use some of it. We all understood that similar gifts would be made each year, what is now called rent. Well, in Coast Salish law, the proceedings of the, the gravity of those conducted at Beacon Hill Park in those days would have been part of a ceremonial event that we now call the potlatch. Guests would have been summoned from far and wide. They would be feasted, regalia worn, gifts distributed. Latasse offers us a Salish view of the work that was conducted at this conference, feast, or party. Douglas was claiming the right as the CM of the Whites to the occupation of the fort site and surrounding lands. By Coast Salish laws, its claim to uh, ownership was validated through the distribution of gifts, and those who accepted the gifts accepted the work. If I am right in thinking that to the Lekwungen, this event that Douglas hosted was kind of a white man's idea of a potlatch, then there was only a partial meeting of minds. Because in some respects, Fort Victoria was for the whites what a lucrative reef, fishing, reef net fishing site was for the Lekwungen CM. It was a wealth generating asset. And like the CM that owned the, the, the reef net fishing site, Douglas would have been expected to host periodically to affirm his rights to the site and to pass it on to his successors for that matter. And in each time, distribute gifts as, as all the CM did. So here I think what Latasse is telling us when he's talking about rent is the periodic redistribution of wealth that would have confirmed the HBC's right to whatever land uh, both parties thought they were agreeing to. So both, I think, Latasse and Douglas can be right. For his part, I'm sure that Douglas was told likely a distrib distribution of 20 to 40 blankets wasn't gonna, you know, wasn't gonna <laughs> do very much and uh, much larger gifting was needed. And he took that to mean the idea of annual annuities was rejected. The written treaty actually tells us very little about the oral treaty because as I said, aside from the reaction of the, ch the chiefs to the annuities payment, Douglas tells us very little about what First Nations uh, had said. Um, the treaty, as you've seen uh, bits of the text before, uh, and of course it looks something like that, or one of the treaties looks something like that. I'll just uh, read a short expert. Know all men, we the chiefs and people of the tribe or family of Chaconian in this case, do consent to surrender entirely and forever, dot, dot, dot. The conditions of our understanding of this sale is this, that our village sites and enclosed fields are to be kept for our own use, for the use of our children and for those who may follow after us. It is understood, however, that the land itself, with these small exceptions, becomes the entire property of the white people forever. It is also understood that we are at liberty to hunt over the unoccupied lands and to carry on our fisheries as formerly. Well, if we think about this as a pointer to the oral treaty, then what can we, what can we uh, disentangle, if you like, from the written words? Well, let's look at the word forever, for example. If the primary treaty was an oral agreement in a hybrid event that the First Nations understood as a potlatch, then it's probable that given the format and the pointers and what we know from David Latasse, that the CM weren't agreeing to any rights for forever. They were agreeing to the rights that were uh, traditionally established and given to a CM at a feast like this that would have to be renewed periodically. So I think the notion of forever has to be looked at and unpacked. The right to hunt over unoccupied lands and carry on fisheries as formerly, well, that makes perfect sense from a First Nations point of view. But if the written agreement, as I, I do not believe, in fact reflected the oral agreement, then we would have to draw the totally unreasonable con conclusion that a woman 
we're told that while they might hunt over an occupied lands, they may not gather berries, they might not harvest trees, they might not dig camas, they might not harvest uh, or uh, strip cedar bark over unoccupied lands. Surely the Lekwamen in the oral treaty would have had a clause to say, well, you know, over unoccupied lands, we are going to have the right to hunt and to harvest. What would the term unoccupied lands mean in the context of an oral agreement? Well, remember now that the First Nations had had about 20 years of experience with the Bay, uh, first at Fort Langley in the 1820s and uh, uh, subsequently at Fort Victoria. And all their experience of forts, whether it was the ones in Puget Sound or up the Fraser River, were the same. A small picketed enclosure surrounded by a few farms. In 1850, this was exactly the case in Fort Victoria. No land had been sold to settlers except a small piece way out in Souk. Uh, and the only other uh, settlement outside of what's now a very small part of downtown Victoria was a mill in Esquimalt uh, Harbor. Douglas himself probably could not have envisaged a, a settler population larger than the one he knew at Fort Vancouver. All the land that the Lekwungen had used for generations, excepting a few hundred acres, was unoccupied, and in this context was unoccupied land, and as far as a reasonable person could see, would be unoccupied indefinitely. What would enclosed fields uh, mean? Well, that question was asked uh, by uh, Mr. Underwood this morning. What would enclosed fields mean in an oral agreement between the Lekwungen and the fur traders? Well, on the British side, uh, they might have had an idea about enclosed fields, but I think even in Britain, fields were often cleared, the stones removed from the center of the field, placed around the edges of the field, and fence or no fence, that was recognized as a field. Or if somebody cleared a bunch of trees and left a clearing in the middle with no fence around it, I think that would have been recognized as an enclosed field. But it's not credible to think in an oral agreement that the Lekwungen, who had extensive potato patches, were still relied on their camas farms for food and trade, would have not wanted these protected and reserved. The only sensible meaning in the context of an oral treaty would have been to have included these lands, whether enclosed in fences or not. If it was clearly explained to First Nations that they were surrendering all their land with specific exceptions, is it credible that they would not have imposed a condition around grave sites? We know from current cultural practices, as well as historic evidence, that the dead were an important part of the Salish spiritual and even social world, were and are. When the treaty commissioners finally came around in the 1870s and 80s, as Dr. Harris uh, mentioned, in setting out reserves in the rest of the province, mortuary, mortuary sites were uh, obviously very important and were protected in, in very small uh, reserves in many cases. Somewhere in the written treaties called the, in the language called village sites or enclosed fields, must point to an oral agreement where the Lekwungen must have heard that the graves of their parents and their ancestors were protected and not given to the whites forever. So the written treaties are the Douglas treaties, but they are not, they are what Douglas decided. They're the Douglas treaties because Douglas had decided what was going to be in them before he met the First Nations. They are not, however, the Salish and Kwakwaka treaties, which were an oral treaty formed by oral agreement. In sum, the apparent disagreement between the chiefs James Douglas and David Latasse is really an entree to explore the question not of what the written treaty says or even of what the written treaty means, but what it can tell us about the real treaty, the oral agreement that was made in the last days of April and the first days of May in Victoria in 1850 and still binds us all today. Heichka, Gaelic Tesla. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. John? So uh, I'd like to open the floor now for uh, comments or questions, if you have any. <laughs> 
one is a political opportunity and the conversation which um, needs to happen between Indigenous and Crown governments, um, resulting either in clarifications or legislation or agreements or protocols or whatever is required for the jurisdictional interplay between Indigenous and Crown governments in implementing the treaties to take place. And that political conversation hasn't happened. The governments have come to the table with treaty negotiation mandates and even mandates and to conclude agreements which have been based on Crown dominance, not based on a recognition of Indigenous laws and the jurisdictional space for the treaties. So I think that we've got, on one hand, the need in whatever litigation, which is the, which is really the, um, the trip rope. I mean, when you can't deal with something on a political level, you're, you're driven to the court in the same way as we saw with Earl Claxton Jr. I mean, either the 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 the, the um, he ends up in the water or we end up in court, and so the politics goes as far as it can. And then when it can't go any further, we end up in court. So I think that the question that you've asked is actually equally relevant to the political domain as it is to the um, judicial. And I think that what we, where I see um, some of the um, big um, issues right now which need to go, go forward on both planes and may end up in court, one is a challenge to the government negotiation mandates which it brings to tables, which basically are out of line with the jurisprudence and continue to even deny the very court cases which have asked for and compelled a different result. And I think that there's going to need to be litigation in that context. And I think we're also going to likely face litigation because of the action of Crown governments in continuing to override um, treaties. Um, and most particularly the Enbridge situation where the governments want to um, roll through, steamroller through um, a project which they consider to be in the national interest and they're prepared to run roughshod over the environment and um, run roughshod over the basic crown obligations arising out of consultation and accommodation and, and, and in, in complete disregard of the jurisdictional play with the treaties. And I think we're going to need, we're going to be forced by that kind of um, crown action to have to use the treaties in court defensively. So I think that those are two big areas. And I think the third that um, we've seen some um, hopefully, we're not going to have to go to court, but we may. We've seen some talk about it today. One is the water rights situation that Chloe talked about this morning. Another is the definition of villages and enclosed fields. There's a lot of land out there where First Nations had villages at the time of the treaty and certainly are entitled to have that land as reserve land, which is not today. Um, when you look at the enclosed fields, um, when you go up into Kwagyuth country, it could very much much um, be the entire land from, um, from right across where the um, so-called extinguishment clause of the treaty rests from Port Hardy to Port McNeil. All that land, that small 12 uh, mile stretch could very easily be an enclosed field because it was all providing the forests which provided the economy which supported the fishery. It's a fishery forest economy which was provided that way so I could see litigation moving in that direction as well. So um, I think if, if I were to look at where the um, next generation of litigators is going, I'd say that those are probably some of the key um, areas which will end up becoming the subject of litigation. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Eric Pelkey, you say I was First Nation. Um, you now, in, the, in the papers that I've uh, I've seen, in the correspondence that I've seen, in the time of the treaty was drawn up, it seemed that uh, um, there was some type of basic understanding that to protect uh, our way of life through the treaty, and uh, I think that's that's a lot of what. What our people also also felt, and uh, the elders have passed down, is that that they thought it was a, a protection of our way of life, a protection of our economy, and that uh, that the right to fish and hunt as formerly 
really meant to, to carry on the way we were living, to, to be able to trade and to be able to, to take what we needed and to uh, protect those areas also that, that uh, had our resources in there, had our, had our wildlife, had our fish in there. You know, and uh, I think that the, the treaty meant a lot more than just to, just to go out and hunt and go out and fish. It meant to protect those areas also that contained all those things, you know, and, and I think that uh, we had a, a pretty vibrant economy at the time of the signing of the treaty, and I think that that means that we have a right to the resources. We have a right to, to the fishery. We have a right, you know, to, to be able to, to hunt, and, you know, and we keep going to court and we keep winning, yet uh, the government doesn't change the law, they just keep uh, keep taking us to court and keep charging us, you know, and so I think, uh, I, I really think it, uh, it's not going to get solved in court. It's, it's going to take political will and it's going to change, like uh, you said earlier, it's going to take the changing of the way of thinking of the people to get out of that colonial attitude that, that has been entrenched in, in, in BC and in Canada to, to keep the people uh, down, or our people down, you know, and uh, you can still see that in, in the way the government deals with us, and it, it's, a, it's a real colonialist attitude and how they deal with us and in how they, every time they say they're giving us more rights, it's really, uh, it's really just a show all the time where uh, the, the government wants to keep their thumb on you and dealing with your territory, dealing with your rights, dealing with your land, even if it's with the land within your little reserve. All of our, our uh, old villages out in the Gulf Islands there, uh, most of them aren't, aren't recognized. And I, you know, for example, uh, when you're talking about the archival record, you know, uh, I found uh, the first record of, uh, of the first, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, when they uh, survey, survey land, the survey, first survey record in James Island, and uh, our, our people were driven off there, and the first surveyor comes on there and he says, uh, I found, uh, a village here of unknown origin, <laughs> you know, and uh, our uh, our uh, my great grandfather was born in that village. And the chief Louis Pelkey was born there, and that's how we knew about it. And then I find this this record in there saying that uh, they found of uh, structures and buildings in a village of unknown origin. Because we're right across the bay from that damn thing, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that uh, really shows you that uh, whoever wrote that had a, had an agenda. So uh, uh, that that's just my feelings about uh, where we need to go with this. Right, Thank you. Thank you. One thing that struck me while all of sorry, did you want to just say a word or two? Yeah. Well, it's just a word or two in relation to that. It comes down partly to, to what Douglas was, was uh, thinking. He, he certainly was interested in creating space for a settler colony. But Douglas is an unusual man. And later on the mainland, he, more than any other government official, with the possible exception of Gilbert Malcolm Sprode, is trying to create reasonable space for native people, for a viable, continuing native economy, at least for, uh, for several generations. And so it's quite possible that here on Vancouver Island, Douglas is trying to do two things at once, to create a, uh, a viable place in the long term for uh, the native inhabitants of the island and also to open up space for a, uh, a settler colony. If that's so, I think a few years later, 
when the settlement begins on the mainland and Douglas reflects on the island experience, I think he's come to the conclusion that the treaties haven't worked. Uh, he's, uh, he reports in one of his, his letters that native people on the island were starving. And I think it, it, one can argue that it's partly for that reason that by 1861, Douglas is telling surveyors on the mainland to grant native people, when they go out to, to uh, allocate reserve, reserves to find out from native uh, people how much land they want and where they want it and to give it to them. And some very large reserves were laid out in, uh, on, on the mainland in British Columbia through the lower Fraser Valley, up in the, along the Thompson River in parts of the, uh, the Okanagan. Douglas retires in 1864. A settler society doesn't agree with what, what he's done. He, these large reserves are uh, withdrawn. But perhaps the comment that, that the treaties on Vancouver Island were intended to create a viable space for native societies is, uh, in relation to Douglas's thinking, is real. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hurth. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Gord Elliott. I'm from uh, Sarlip First Nation, uh, North Douglas Treaty. <clears throat> uh, Chief David Lattes is uh, my He's my ancestor, and uh, the oral tradition <clears throat> is passed down in our uh, throughout our communities and our families, and uh, it's alive and well. The stories behind it, uh, it's a little bit off. What uh, uh, what was stated today? It was uh, uh, I never heard that it was a, a peace treaty, and it was a a treaty of a, a peaceful coexistence. Uh, <clears throat> basically, what I wanted to say today is that uh, our uh, our ancestors, when they signed the treaty, they wanted to protect our way of life, and that way of life was hunting and fishing, and and within that uh, was our I heard it earlier was our economy. Uh, there was our it was our main resources, and and through that. Uh, um, obviously, it has not been protected. Uh, we cannot extract those same resources today. Uh, where we live in, uh, in Brentwood Bay in the Saanich Inlet, <clears throat> I can't even take my son out fishing for salmon anymore because there's no more in there. I heard, uh, I heard uh, Chloe talk earlier about uh, water and uh, <clears throat> water rights. And uh, I'd like to know what's being done about... Uh, uh, water and uh, like wastewater, like stormwater, for instance. Because when we take a look at uh, stormwater management plans, those kind of things, <clears throat> these are things that uh, drain into, our, drain into our, our, our streams and our rivers and into our inlets and into our bays. And these are the things that, that do affect our habitat today. And <clears throat> I, haven't heard any, I haven't heard any mention of it but I know that uh, when I spoke to a marine biologist in our local municipality, he, uh, every, and every marine biologist can confirm this, that uh, uh, those uh, stormwater management plans, they do affect, um, they do affect our, our habitat. And <clears throat> today, today I would like to know what, what we can do uh, to be able to extract uh, resources uh, from our traditional territories. The same, the same game, the same foods uh, are not there for us today. We can still take our children out and, uh, and teach them, but it's not the same. You know, I, know, I haven't heard anything about economics here today. You know, we have, uh, we have children that we have to look after, grandchildren, our grandchildren's grand grandchildren. You know, that's who we have to think about. Not only, not only about saving the environment, but how are we going to, how are we going to be able to extract resources from our traditional territories and the use of our lands? I know that's a bigger, I know that's a bigger question, but, uh, uh, you know, tying the, you know, there's no political will. I heard that earlier. And there's no, like, real political economy to it. Like, there's no... How can, we, how can we tie the economics into this? You know, hunting and fishing is, uh, it was a way of life for us, but it was also a huge part of our economy and our governance systems. <clears throat>
I just wanted to put that out there today and hopefully somebody can make a, a comment on it. You know, I, I like, I love to see the day where, you know, we're having uh, economists sit at our table and uh, political scientists where we can begin to move forward and we can start putting this into place. <clears throat> Hi, Scott. We had originally hoped for a panel on economic development, actually, and we just, it just didn't come to fruition in the, in the amount of time we, we had to organize it. But it's a good point. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Mavis Underwood. I'm also from SEO. Uh, my name is uh, Siwanamot. Siwanamot is a name that's uh, been given to me uh, through my great-grandmother. It comes from here in Nanaimo. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. I have very close ties and the uh, references that have been made to the Clallam, Puget Sound, we are very closely related. We did not have an international boundary between us. We were family, and we still remain to be family to this day. And uh, I think that my concern has always been about the discussion today of water rights, protection of habitat. I believe that the province deliberately grants commercial uh, licenses to crabbers and uh, clammers. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a racist person, but it's an oriental market and uh, they're depleting, they're extinguishing um, what we would harvest in our own territory. Uh, I know the Elliot and the Bartleman family in a traditional way put boughs down in the water with a number of trees I mark every year, that's, that's theirs, to have the herring lay their eggs on there and the whole thing was taken. And I, and I believe that those kind of things are a very deliberate way to continue to undermine us in our own territory. And I, and I think that the province needs to be taken to task and the federal government should be protecting those rights and there should be no more contribution to the extinguishment of the rights in our own land because we are constantly having to defend ourselves against all different kinds of onslaughts and, and even with respect to economic development, fighting over uh, uh, contaminated groundwater and things like that, um, that uh, it, it should be something that the federal government puts its resources behind uh, and helps with that because they have certainly contributed to those rights being undermined. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Talia Mitzten. I'm from Tsechem in Saanich. First of all, I'd like to thank, raise my hands to our host, Sinanaimo people, my family and friends here, Vancouver Island University for hosting this amazing event. It's like what was said earlier when we first started this morning, the gathering of this knowledge of the people that have worked in and around the Douglas Treaties in our communities for decades. You know, I'm honored to be in your presence today. As I was saying to a few people over lunch, you know, if we had, you know, all of you folks in a small room talking about this, you know, I'd love to be the fly on the wall just listening to that discussion and debate and arguments, I'm sure. It'd been an awesome, awesome um, discussion. Those tapes will be available later uh, in the lobby. <laughs> anyway, um, as I said, my name is Talib Mitzton. I got that name from my grandfather, who that name had laid dormant for 50 years because he passed away quite, quite a few years ago. And I received that name from, through him. And he received that name from his uncle, a man. We just heard Mavis talk about the relationships that we have with the Kalalam people. Well, I'm of that people. My name comes from the Kalalam people. And you know we've read and we've heard the, the movement of those people into the southern tip of Vancouver Island, well, I'm a product of that. Anyway, I just want to um, comment about what's happening here and, um, you know, the idea of all this knowledge, and I keep hearing it and I've heard it around the table, I've heard it today, the idea of the strength and the, the authority that we continue to have because of this agreement, this document, this treaty, these papers, this form, whatever you want to call it, it gives us and it 
verifies that we have this right, this authority to do these things. But you have to look at it from my point of view as a simple community person. My community does not have the capacity or the resources to put into action a lot of these things that we've been told. To go into court and to fight these arguments takes millions of dollars, as we all know. So the simple thing that we have to do is to keep it simple. That means we have to sit with the politicians, the technical people, the experts, the ac academia world, and work together and put it into reality. You know, we've heard it's not been implemented. The government doesn't agree with it. The government fights it at every, every opportunity they get. My, you know, I've been listening to this stuff since I was a child. My, my late mom, she talked about um, meetings that her uncle had with David Latesse when they were talking just about these things, gathering together and talking. And I grew up listening to these stories that my mom talked about. The, the lawyer, as, as we call it, the, the interpreters. In our big house, the speakers. She'd tell the stories of this gentleman that came from um, Katsy and acted as their interpreters for all their, all their work. So I've grown up with this, and then I continue the struggle. Um, but all, I, all I'd like to say is, again, just thank you. Make, and I want to make these comments so that, you know, you folks really understand. It's great to have all of this thrust upon us and put upon us, but it is still a struggle to uh, put it into action. Thank you very much. Hayesh Garcia. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tara Thurber. I'm from CHLY 101.7 FM VIU's campus station. Um, my question is for Louise. You mentioned that um, we now have the legal constitutional space to steward the land. And I just wondered if you could explain maybe that. And are you talking about like seven generations land use policy when you say that? And maybe you could, yeah, just discuss it a little bit further. Thank you. When I was, um, it's a beautiful question because that's really the implementation. The um, law, ha the legal status quo and the political status quo are not the same. The legal status quo really um, requires that there be shared decision making and revenue and benefit sharing and that there be a, uh, there be an implementation of the fact that there's coexisting jurisdictions which have been recognized in law, which also um, recognize the coexistence of two titles and two titles not having the same origin, indigenous titles coming from the ancient laws and practices not, not created by the crown, not dependent upon crown grants or crown recognition. Re crown recognition, and whereas crown title coming from a totally different source. And so we really, the law supports coexistence of jurisdictions, which means shared decision making and revenue and benefit sharing. That's what the law supports, but the political status quo is really quite different. So when you ask the question, well, how is it that we'll see this implemented on the ground? I think we're back to the question and which was so beautifully raised by some of the speakers, and that is how do you force a government to actually places in the province which have, for example, on Haida Gwaii, through the logging um, dispute at Lyle Island, the result has been Guaihanas, which is a um, which is a large area of Haida Gwaii, which is collaboratively managed, and the Archipelago Management Board is, um, works by consensus, and it's got an equal number of Haida and Crown um, officials on it, and they've, for 25 years, managed the land in the most, in the most perfect of ways. Um, National Geographic said that it's the number one national park in the world, and of course, the Haida don't call it a national park, but it's allowed for the continuation of their um, of their culture and their economy. And these um, shared decision-making arrangements should 
should be possible throughout the entire province with the benefits um, shared as well. So we've got a challenge to bridge the gap between the legal and the political status quo until we're seeing the, ma the laws of Indigenous people managing the land, not just managing the practices and the um, hunting and fishing and other um, practices, but also managing the land and making decisions about how the resources will be used and who's going to benefit for, for, for seven generations. And I really love that seven generations because I was told that it's not just seven generations into the future, but it's also seven generations into the past. So it gives us a very long window to start looking at management decisions, which is certainly not the opportunistic way that the present government works. Thank you. Okay, the, uh, the conference organizing committee and uh, the Sklenamic First Nation. Oh, sorry, you have questions? We've got time for one more. Hi, I'm Joni Olson from Sartlet First Nation, also. Um, my question is around um, the so called vagueness of the Douglas Treaty. And since we're talking to the interpretation panel, and we've heard a really, you know, full description from numbers eight people so far today of um, the interpretation of the Douglas Treaty. And I see that when we ask direction, what direction should we take, and it's legal, and it's going to cost us millions and millions of dollars, which we're also on the peninsula, and, you know, there's million dollar houses surrounding us, but we don't have a penny of it. And so I'm just wondering, other than the BC treaty process, which we will we refuse to get into because of how flawed it is, is there a way to interpret this treaty so that the government gets it, since in this room we seem to get it, and it doesn't seem like it, it comes out as a bigger picture, as something that's understandable. And um, so, um, is there, where to clar is there a way to clarify it, I suppose, um, in your mind, to make it um, clear to the government for us? <laughs> I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, Joni, the answer to that question. I, I do think, though, that uh, we can start by saying that uh, we don't accept the language, the written language of the Douglas Treaties, and we want to think about what that treaty would have meant to First Nations at the time, and uh, you know what words they would have put in, and start from that basis. Because I think, you know, trying to kind of fit grave sites into enclosed fields, or trying to fit harvesting, uh, you know, uh, sacred medicines into the hunting rights of the Douglas Trees, uh, it, it's it's a it's sort of a futile effort, um, and and so I think starting. Uh, is a new interpretation of not the Douglas treaties, but the whatever we'll call them, the Salish treaties or the Kwakwaka treaties, and uh, as an oral treaty, and, and and have the communities spend some time with their elders and think, okay, what what what, what would that meant to us at the time? What would we have asked if we wanted to come to some accommodation with with Fort Victoria, with the Hudson's Bay Company, and maybe argue from start arguing from that position rather than from the text of the Douglas treaties. Yeah, and I, I just think um, we are so uh, consumed by the deconstruction of the text that we lose sight of the fact that the the, um, the memories of the, the treaty from the First Nations side um, are, are not collected and, and preserved and, and respected in the same sort of way. And it seems like we spend a lot of time, especially in the archives, looking at the textual record and the supporting documentation, which really doesn't tell us anything about the roles, the thoughts, the intentions, the hopes that the, um, the First Nations who, who were encountering in colonialism on the West Coast at the time um, were thinking, and which Cole Harris has written about very well. Um, because it, it, we're so, it seems we're so obsessed. That, um, uh, one, I was always thinking of this line that I wrote once, that uh, trying to interpret the will of the, the signatories, the Aboriginal signatories to this treaty, is like the proverbial Buddhist imagining the sound of one hand clapping. They're, I mean, the roles were completely different. And we can be obsessed by the text um, forever, and we still won't get um, a, a, a remembrance from, from the First Nations in that participation by looking at the text. Um, we can get hints and shadows and suggestions, but 
it's the living memory that's passed on in the oral tradition, and that's what's lacking in the archives, I think. And that's what I mean by trying to get more archival participation from First Nations. I just wanted to say one thing. I don't know really whether the problem is interpretation, even though I know the treaty is very simple in its terms. Because um, White and Bob, you know, people charged with hunting under provincial wildlife. Barlman, people charged with provincial hunting under uh, charged with hunting under provincial wildlife. Morris and Olson, people charged with hunting under provincial wildlife. The government doesn't give up. Even when we win in court, they keep coming back and trying to undermine that um, clarification of the law. So I don't really know if the matter is just about interpretation. I think it is a sh it's a shift of mindset by Crown governments that they have to uh, move into even what the courts have said about reconciliation, which, have, which they, in the context of treaties, have said that treaties reconcile the pre-existing Aboriginal sovereignty with the assumed sovereignty of the Crown. So I think that we've got to shift the dialogue from denial into recognition, from denial into reconciliation, from denial into recognition that the pre-existing Aboriginal sovereignty and the assumed sovereignty of the crown is what the table has to start to talk about. And so it's not really that helpful in terms of, you know, prescribing a path forward. But I did want to, even though we are in a panel about interpretation, my experience is that it's not about the vagueness of the treaty. It's about the domination by the crown to, um, to the lands and the resources and that, that they don't give up. My comment will be unhelpful. <laughs> My impression of these things, looking across the whole span of the country, is that the interest of colonizers has been exceedingly powerful. That colonizers have come in by and large and have taken what they wanted. And that the law has been some defense against this, but not very much. And that treaties have been used to Dispossess, I think, the, the, uh, by and large, the Royal Proclamation itself, which can be seen in one hand as a bulwark of the defense of Native rights. It was a very convenient document for the appropriation of Native land. It allowed the Crown to do it on its own terms and to eliminate competition from the Eastern Seaboard colonies. That was the principal function of the, uh, of the uh, Royal Proclamation. So I guess my rather lugubrious conclusion is that it's all very well to address the legal rights and wrongs of these things, but in the final, it's in a sense what you're saying, Louise, in the final analysis, you run into another set of interests that are prepared to fi find some way or other around almost whatever accommodation one comes up with. And it seems to me that I came to the conclusion at the end of the book on, the, on these things that treaties are in a sense too visible and too stark and that they, they channel emotions. They seem dogmatic, they seem final, they seem constitutional, they raise, they raise hackles. I thought that some of the comments that made this morning by Ruby, Ruby, is it, uh, was it? Who, they, they, from, from, uh, from Cape Mudge. J Jody, from Jody, about the importance of another tier of, um, of resolution of these things, of a whole set of less prominent uh, uh, agreements that fly a little bit below the radar. Um, it, it seemed to, I, I, I think she's onto a, a promising track there. And it may be that the insistence on treaties is, is not, only, not only leads to it just in an an endless round of inconclusive negotiation, and even when these negotiations are, are, are finalized, doesn't often entail the results that one expects from them. Now that's not a very encouraging comment, I know, <laughs> but it's, it, it, I, I, I've looked at some of this across the country, and I am struck by the power of these incoming settler colonial regimes to achieve what they want to achieve. And they're more than prepared to bend the law 
to, uh, to serve their interests. Thank you all. I think we have to kind of cut it there, but uh, for the, the conference organizing committee and the Snamuk First Nation and the Vancouver Island University, but first of all, I'd like you all to wel welcome you all to welcome you all uh, here and, and uh, thank you for coming. And uh, to remind you about the presentation by Thomas Berger tonight at 5.30 in this room, but also to acknowledge our panel uh, for their efforts in coming here this afternoon. I would like to call upon Snanamo Councillor Michael Weiss to assist me. Weiss? Sorry, Michael? John Lutz. <laughs> Dr. Cole Harris. <laughs> Raymond Frogner. Louise Mandel. And last but not least, our moderator, Dr. Keith Smith. 